Hello folks, today we will be talking about uh, diabetes in pediatric practice. So most of this talk would be about type 1 diabetes, which is one of the most common uh, diabetes in the pediatric age group. Now before we start, those of you who don't me don't know me, my name is Dr. Sayed Kasmi. I'm a pediatrician. If you are visiting my channel for the very first time, please do subscribe to my channel and press the bell notification icon so whenever I upload a new video, you are always on board with me. And if you like my videos, please uh, press the like button and share it with your friends because knowledge needs to be spread. Fine, so without further ado, let's dive in and get started. So let's start with the definition. Diabetes is defined as a state of chronic hyperglycemia. So chronic means that it's the, it's been there for some time. Hyperglycemia means increased levels of glucose in the blood and that is caused by number one either deficiency of insulin or in action of insulin or a combination of both so what does that mean it means that a state of increased blood sugar which is there for some period of time and it is caused either by a deficiency of insulin so either the insulin is low in quantity or it's simply not there or if the insulin is there, it's not able to exert its effects because of the faulty receptors or because of the down regulation of receptors or because for many other reasons. Or sometimes it could be a combination of both where the insulin is low in quantity and at the same time the receptors are also not working. So that encompasses so many conditions. So this is a very simple definition of diabetes. Now, in the past, diabetes have been classified in many different ways. The most recent uh, classification of diabetes comes from World Health Organization. So World Health Organization in 2019 has defined diabetes into the following types. Type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, monogenic diabetes and secondary diabetes. Now, type 1 diabetes was formerly called insulin dependent diabetes mellitus while the type 2 was known as non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus they also used uh, different subtypes like iddm or type 1 was classified as a 1a and 1b which is no more used because uh, they are not using any further uh, subclassifications whether it's caused by autoimmunity or whether it's caused by like idiopathic reason they simply say it's type 1 diabetes mellitus which is caused by relative deficiency of insulin or simply insulin is not there for whatever causes that relative deficiency of insulin or causes insulin uh, to be not there type 2 diabetes is was previously known as non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus or adult onset diabetes mellitus now it simply caused type 2 diabetes mellitus they don't call it adult onset because uh, sometimes it can happen in the young age group as well though a bit rare then the third group is monogenic diabetes. So monogenic diabetes is a, a separate entity of diabetes which is caused by single gene effects. Now the type 1 and type 2 are polygenic. So there are different genes along with environmental factors which can be responsible for causing type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And there is a combination as I told you there is a combination of environmental factors and genetic factors. And these genetic factors are polygenetic like there are different genes which might be involved in the process. Monogenic diabetes, on the other hand, is caused by a single gene problems, single gene deficiencies or flaws, and uh, that includes uh, number one, um, maturity onset diabetes of the young, which is also known as Moody. Now, this is not the Indian Prime Minister Moody. This Moody stands for maturity onset diabetes of the young. It also includes neonatal diabetes. So, neonatal diabetes, the diabetes that happens within the first uh, six months of uh, life. That is known as neonatal diabetes and most of that like probably 95 96 percent of these cases are monogenic in nature so this is altogether a separate entity which is known as monogenic diabetes and then we have got the secondary diabetes secondary diabetes is the diabetes which is caused by uh different secondary issues like the issue is not basically in insulin like in in terms of its quantity or quality it's simply that the counter uh, regulatory hormones which actually act against insulin they are increased in quantity for one reason or the other reason so in conditions in which you have got like lots of counter regulatory hormones like increase in glucagon like glucagonoma 
or increase in adrenal hormones like Cushing syndrome. So uh, that can cause uh, secondary or certain conditions like cystic fibrosis or hemochromatosis where like it's not only the endocrine pancreas that is at fault but the exocrine pancreas also for that as a whole there are issues with the pancreas so we call it as secondary uh, diabetes and sometimes it can also occur because of certain drugs which are being used and that can cause diabetes as their side effects so that is another entity as well but anyhow for the sake of simplicity i will just put it as a part of the secondary diabetes so just remember we told we talked about the the, the definition and is as simple as that as far as the classification goes that we have got the type one we have got the type two we have got the monogenic diabetes which includes the maturity onset diabetes of the young and the neonatal diabetes and then we've got the secondary diabetes where the problem is not only in the endocrine part but is also there in the exocrine part of the pancreas and includes problems like Cushing syndrome uh, hemochromatosis and diabetes secondary to uh, drugs okay now moving on to the next slide let's talk about the presenting features now below one year of age it's quite rare and i'm talking about type 1 diabetes because again when uh, initially when i was introducing this lecture i told you that when we talk about diabetes in the young most of the time it is uh, type 1 diabetes but again rarely it could be like monogenic diabetes as well and it could be maturity onset diabetes of the young as well but irrespective of whatever is the type of diabetes usually in those kids who are less than one year of age usually most of the time it's an accidental diagnosis so because they have got non-specific symptoms and probably you are doing workup for something else and as a part of routine investigation you find that they've got hyperglycemia a persistent hyperglycemia and then you find out that oh well fine they seem to be diabetic and a further workup then you know can actually pinpoint the cause of the diabetes most of the times they would present above one year of age like it could be anywhere during the infancy or early childhood or late childhood or even during the adolescent age so it might present in one of the following three forms it might be the symptomatic form where they usually present with um, weight loss they can present with polyuria polydipsia and fatigue so weight loss means that despite having a good diet they start losing weight Polyuria simply means that they are passing excessive urine. So that is because they have a lot of osmotically active substances in the urine, which is glucose in this particular uh, case. And glucose, you know, draws water along with itself. So that causes polyuria. And at the same time, they've got polydipsia because there is increasing thirst. So they drink, drink, drink. And that is polydipsia. And they've got fatigue. The fatigue is because of the reason that despite having um, like increased quantity of glucose in their blood, they are not able to metabolize it. It's a metabolic problem. So glucose is there, but then it's not able to go inside the cell, especially inside the muscle cells to be converted into the energy cycle. So that's why they've got fatigue. They've got weakness. They've got lethargy. Or sometimes they are simply well. And then, you know, all of a sudden they present with diabetic ketoacidosis so they are fine 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 and then one fine morning they start like throwing up they've got tummy ache they don't feel well they might have a fruity smell to their breath they have got tummy ache and uh, they might be brought into the hospital and it might be thought that they might have gastroenteritis or something and uh, you do the blood glucose levels or even the cap gas shows that the blood glucose is elevated and the ketones are raised or the urine also shows ketones so that is what we call as an accidental diagnosis or in the form of dka like the very first position of uh, diabetes as a diabetic ketoacidosis and uh, we've seen like quite a few cases like this in our practice and the third thing again could be accidental diagnosis against like those who are completely asymptomatic they don't have any symptoms but like for non-specific symptoms you are doing work up for something else let's say they present with an infection you're doing a workup of the infection and in the meanwhile you find out that they've got increased blood glucose levels and then you do and you find out that they are diabetic so it can present in one of these uh, forms okay moving on what is the diagnostic criteria so the diagnostic criteria again uh, nice national institute of clinical excellence follows the who guidelines and the who guideline says that a single fasting blood glucose level of seven or greater than seven millimoles per liter if you are using the metric system then it would be 126 milligram per deciliter so it would be either 126 if you are using that 
or in UK we use the millimole system so it is either equal to so seven if like somebody has got seven then obviously that is fulfilling the criteria for uh, diabetes or it is greater than that, 7.1 7.2 and that is fasting blood glucose so fasting means that the child has not eaten for at least eight hours eight hours fast and after that you do a fasting blood glucose and it is greater than or equal to seven millimole or 126 millimole per deciliter or if they've got symptoms like thirst, polydipsia, polyuria, lethargy, and a random blood glucose that is done any time of the day is greater than or equal to 11.1 millimole per liter, which equals the around, um, that is 200 milligram per deciliter. And that is in the presence of symptoms. So one simple reading, if they are symptomatic, gives you the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus but in case if they are asymptomatic then it has to be repeated on another occasion and if it is again elevated greater than or equal to 11.1 or 200 then the uh, diagnosis of diabetes is confirmed uh, there was a bit of uh, controversy regarding HbA1c levels. Some of the previous texts used to say that HbA1c levels should not be used in diagnosis of diabetes in children or in the young people but who now recommends that an hba1c level because hbac a1c which is actually glycosylate hemoglobin gives you a very good uh, picture of how the glycemic control has been in the last two to three months if that is equivalent or greater than 6.5 percent which equates to 48 millimoles then again uh, the child would be classified as diabetic now, NICE guidelines says, and this is very important, you should understand this, that any child that is 0 to 18 years of age and he fulfills this criteria, of he, you consider him to be diabetic, should be always assumed to be type 1 diabetic. Remember, in children, we always classify them as type 1 diabetic unless and until we have got evidence that they might fit in monogenic diabetes or they might have type 2 diabetes, which is a bit rare in the pediatric age group. So they say after diagnosis, like once we have diagnosed them on this criteria, children who are greater than six months of age, there is no need of doing C-peptide or glutamic acid decarboxylase antibodies. Now, these are the confirmatory tests which tell you that when the C-peptide is low or there are antibodies, that means like, you know, obviously there has been destruction of the uh, insulin cells which uh, secrete um, um, uh, pancreatic cells that secrete insulin. So that does not need to be done. It is only done if you have got a doubt because it doesn't change the management. If they've got antibodies or no antibodies, remember that doesn't change the management. The only thing is if there is doubt that the child might be having other types of diabetes, like he might be having monogenic diabetes or might be having uh, type 2 diabetes. And how would you know? Clinically, the question is, so again, somebody can ask you in the wives, and the, how would you suspect that the child might be having monogenic diabetes or they might be having um, type uh, 2 diabetes? Number one, obviously, if a child is less than six months of age, it's very rarely that they would be type 1 diabetes as I told 95 96 percent of them research has shown us that they are monogenic diabetes again that is known as neonatal we like simply clinically we call it neonatal diabetes mellitus and it could be temporary and permanent as well again if you read Nelson textbook of pediatrics it says it might, it might be temporary where it resolves before one year of age or it might be uh, permanent where it just like carries on into the later life as well so if the child is obese, obesity is one thing which is usually associated with type 2 diabetes, but not in every case, but like sometimes it can be associated. Or if the child has got evidence of insulin resistance. So insulin resistance means that there's no deficiency of insulin, but rather the insulin is not able to exert its effects on its receptors, which is a hallmark of type 2 diabetes. And how would you know if the child has got like, you know, thick brownish leathery uh, patches on the neck or in the axilla we call it acanthosis nigricans so how where would you look for acanthosis nigricans you look it on the neck front or the back of the neck or you also look in the axilla so if there are dark brownish hyperpigmented 
like scaly sometimes it could be scaly as well sometimes it could not scaly it might be you know sort of a macular in 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 nature or sometimes it looks like plaque but it's hyperpigmented lesions in the axilla or on the neck in a bad diabetic child you should be suspecting type 2 diabetes and that condition is known as acanthosis nigricans or as I told you earlier, if the child develops diabetes in the first year of life, or if a child who has been classified as diabetic, and I told you you have taken it as type 1 diabetic, but you see that even during episodes where the blood sugar rises quickly and is quite high, that child never or very rarely develops ketonemia. So despite having very high blood sugar, like let's say even 30, 33, 35 millimoles, and the he rarely like the ketones rarely go up like beyond 0 0.2 0 0.3 millimoles then you should be thinking about type 2 diabetes as well and then you can do the further workup like you know looking for c peptide levels or uh, gad antibodies to see whether he fits in within the type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes so this is the diagnostic criteria of diabetes in children which is recommended by the national institute of clinical excellence the nice i think it's ng18 guideline which is specific to uh, diabetes mellitus moving on straight away treatment how do we treat if somebody has got diabetes especially type 1 diabetes how do we treat it the treatment is insulin Type 1 diabetics are always treated as insulin. There is no other oral drug treatment, though there are a few experimental drugs uh, which have been mentioned in uh, Nelson textbook of pediatrics. But again, they are not routinely used. Uh, it can be used as adjunctive treatment in certain like diabetes, tertiary diabetes centers. But nevertheless, for the sake of simplicity, remember, it is always and always and always insulin. So insulin requirements uh, can differ by age by the growth spurts by the like individual needs can differ from uh, you know from child to child but um, on a rough uh, level i mean usually we say like most of the textbook that it, it can be anywhere between 0.5 to 1 unit per kilogram of body weight per 24 hours so this is what the child needs in 24 hours 0.5 to 1 unit per kilogram per 24 hours so usually we start with 0.5 and if it's like you know we can go up to uh, one sometime we might have even uh, go up to level of 1.2 how is this insulin given remember insulin can only be given in injectable form so we usually give it in the form of basal bolus regime so this is one of the most widely used recommended form of insulin therapy basal bolus regime so what is basal bolus regime basal bolus regime is one of the most naturally my making uh, treatment of diabetes your pancreas that secrete insulin to control your blood sugar level so the insulin actually secretes some amount of insulin all the time we call it the basal level of insulin because you always have got like some blood glucose in your shoe uh, in, in, in your blood so that is uh, regulated by this basal levels of insulin so it is kept within those like you know acceptable levels by the basal amount of insulin which is secreted like continuously over 24 hour time period and then you know we take meals so meals are usually contains carbohydrates so that suddenly the carbohydrate because of the carbohydrate digestion the glucose levels they jump up so then the pancreas has to do extra work by like releasing boluses of insulin to counter that like large amount of glucose that suddenly comes into the blood so that is a bolus so if you see like if i draw uh, like a normal 24 hour insulin so if this is the x and the y axis so we have got this basal insulin which is being secreted all the time and then let's say this is morning this is lunch time and dinner time where we take so then the insulin suddenly we need more insulin so the insulin would jump at this level the pancreas protein more insulin so this is the basal and this is the bolus so we have to give insulin in such a form that it mimics these curves that is known as basal bolus regime basal bolus regime so what we do we have to give to counter it because the insulin is deficient in the uh, type 1 diabetes we have to cover for this basal level by giving basal insulin so basal insulin usually is a long acting insulin basal insulin is long acting 
insulin like insulin glargan so that is usually given in the evening or at night time and that is usually one dose which takes uh, you know uh, care for the next 24 hours and then we have to use short acting insulin these are short acting insulin regular insulin which is given 15 to 20 uh, minutes before the meals and again the it usually depends like uh, how much carbohydrates the child is taking and there are different like formulas which are used by the dietitians to calculate the um, what we call as carbohydrate to insulin ratio anyhow that is a complex thing i would discuss that in some other lecture because then this like we would be off track so then the three you know the child needs three boluses of uh, insulin in the form of regular insulin before the meals that would take care of the uh, hyperglycemia caused by the meals so remember it's a combination of long acting insulin plus short acting insulin which is given three to four times a day to cover four meals and this is one of the best methods of giving insulin to children who are type 1 diabetics i have seen in developing countries um, i've seen like many pediatricians they use the premixed regimes now premixed regimes are not recommended i know some of them they do it for the sake of simplicity because like let's say you are giving 70 30 mixed start in the morning and evening two third in the morning and one third in the evening but research has shown us that using premixed insulin is leads to poor glycemic control remember research has shown this thing that it leads to poor glycemic control so pre-mixed insulins should preferably not be used in pediatric practice the best thing is to give them basal bolus regime so a child has to be taught how to use the basal insulin once in 24 hours usually in evening or night time and then regular insulin before meals so normally we uh, you know we calculate the total dose of insulin again according to this formula 0.1 to 1 unit per kilogram body weight per 24 hours 50 of that daily insulin requirement is given as basal dose in the evening or the night time and the rest would be given as short acting covers for the boluses so let's say a child who has got let's say um, 70 uh, kg weight and let's say his uh, need is 35 let's say we start with 35.5 uh, units uh, insulin per kg per 24 so his 24 hour requirement would be 35 units now if i divide it into two into 50 percent so that would be eight uh, 17.5 so he would need 17.5 as milligram sorry units units as basal insulin and the rest of 17.5 would be divided by three if he is taking three meals that has to be divided by three so it would roughly come out to be around let's say six units before like six units in the morning six units in the afternoon and six units at uh, night time so this is how we uh, calculate the basal bolus regime and divided into the bill uh, the basal forms and the bolus forms so it's as simple as that recently uh innovation in the field of uh, diabetology has led to the uh, you know uh, inventions of uh, pumps so these are pumps which are attached on the child's body and there are of different types closed loop open loop pumps and they are actually they have got like sensors which are embedded in the uh, skin so they are constantly sensing the uh, blood glucose levels and at the same time they've got hypodermic needles inserted in the skin as well so they can depending on sensing the levels of glucose they can uh, throw the insulin into the body so these are programmable units and uh, they can uh, give continuous insulin so the child does not need to like uh, prick uh, himself or herself every now and then uh sometimes they might forget so this is something which is there it, it's got ease of use because it's just like you uh, put it and sort of for, forget in the sense that like you know you don't need to remember the times of your injection and the things it would just sense it uh it can be programmed according to the needs of the child and then it would be sensing the blood glucose levels and just like you know correcting it by constantly uh pushing the uh, the 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 short acting uh, insulin so here the insulin provides both basal as well as bolus cover so again you don't need a bosal or a basal level like separately there is continuous like you know um, pumping of the insulin from the pump because this pump has got a reservoir and that's got like you know 
different sensors which can read the blood glucose level and accordingly then it can uh, throw the insulin into the body and then uh, you know it's it's easy for the child they don't need to break for themselves and they can uh, just lead a normal life like like other people so these are the two types of insulin uh modality insulin like uh, giving modalities which are used these days for diabetic children's okay moving on now to the comprehensive management the comprehensive management in diabetes well, obviously it's not as simple as that when we say well if you diagnose a child with diabetes and you just calculate their insulin requirements and you start them on a basal bolus regime or you just uh, start them like you know uh, send them to get fitted with an insulin pump once it has been diagnosed that they've got diabetes remember as a pediatrician here in uk we refer them to a pediatrician who has got special interest in diabetes so uh, again it's a multidisciplinary team effort which involves the diabetic um, expert which is as i told you is a pediatrician with the interest in diabetes it includes a gp it includes a dietitian it includes the community diabetic nurse so uh, it, it's it's a teamwork so it's a multidisciplinary team so a diabetologist would look into the child health status and would like you know uh, set up the insulin levels and everything else might even fit him with the insulin pump if needed a diabetes nurse looks at the compliance and you know would look after the day-to-day -day issues which can come up with the you know insulin therapy gp actually is responsible that uh, he makes appropriate referrals and he is like giving them the appropriate uh, uh prescriptions of insulin and all those things that the child needs and the dietitian would be responsible for looking into the diet pattern of the child and you know making all these like ratios adjustable so that um, a child has got good glycemic control so the main purpose of diabetes management is to maintain a healthy lifestyle for the child ensuring that the blood glucose level remain within the normal range so like like four to uh, probably uh, four to seven uh, millimole uh, before uh, the meals and uh, probably uh, six to uh, eight, nine or ten millimoles after the meal so this is like what we would say an acceptable range in which we need to keep the blood sugar levels for our diabetic child so it's also very important that this multidisciplinary team also involves like family education regarding the conditions so it's very important that the family knows that what is this condition it's not simply telling the diabetes and putting them on insulin they need to be taught what is diabetes what has caused that what are the factors that can you know increase insulin requirements what to do when the child becomes sick what to do if the child has got a hypoglycemic attack how to recognize that how to recognize diabetic ketoacidosis they might have mental health issues as well so how to take care of those mental health issues uh, then how to set up the meals how to uh, calculate the carbohydrate ratio so on and so forth so this is very important it's not only simply putting them insulin a lot of more work has to be done in order to make sure that they 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 they, 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 they have got a good quality of life at the same time they also need to be taught about like the sick rule sick day rules so sick day rules are um, basically uh, some of the guidelines if a child who is not feeling well because obviously when a child becomes ill because of anything like it might be any other like trivial infection or some like other infection that he suffers from uh, during that time the under the you know the body is in stress so under stress uh, his um, needs might change so how to cater for those change needs so like for example if a child is constantly vomiting then how he checks for his blood glucose level how he checks for his ketone levels and then based on those ketone levels how he manages his insulin by increase so usually let, let's say if um, there is moderate increase in ketone levels but not to the extent where it would go into what we call as the dka range which is more than three uh, millimoles um, blood ketone level so then let's say if it is 0.5 or to one between 0.5 and 1 then how they can increase 10 percent of their uh basal uh insulin levels to uh, you know get for these increased needs so these are sick day rules again i would take that in some separate lecture this is all together like you know sick day rules and uh, how do we do this carbohydrate insulin ratios you know these things uh we will take it up in some other lecture it's also important that they do daily uh, um, blood glucose testing so at least four blood glucose testings uh one before every meal and uh, one at bedtime is is important that they do that and they keep a diary of their blood glucose level so that if there is any problem like if 
there are uh, variations in the blood glucose level that uh, because of certain problems like somogi phenomenon or dawn phenomenon that can be picked up and addressed uh, most common complications are of uh, are diabetic ketoacidosis and hypoglycemia but these are the most common if you ask you what is the most common hypoglycemia and dka diabetic ketoacidosis though there are other complications long-term chronic complications can include like cataracts um, microangiopathy uh, it can include uh, damage to the re 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 renal blood vessels it can include neuropathy so on and so forth so like you know multiple organs can get involved in that uh, two things that uh, i would like to mention here is number one uh, somogi phenomenon and dawn phenomenon these are another complications which many people they don't understand but it's very simple so mogi phenomenon is basically if the night time usually if the basal uh, uh, insulin is increased in quantity for one reason or the other reason so what would happen increased insulin would lead to hypoglycemia so the child would sleep but what would happen he would have hypoglycemia in the early hours of the morning this hypoglycemia what would it do because the only the insulin is definitely the counter regulatory hormone in the body are normal so what would happen an increase in the counter regulatory hormones so the cortisol and um, adrenaline and everything would jump so what would happen is that they would increase blood glucose levels so the blood glucose would be very high in the morning a very high blood glucose in morning because of an increased basal dose at night time and what has it done the pathophysiology increased basal dose has caused hypoglycemia which has led to increase in the counter regulatory hormones leading to hyperglycemia early in the morning the other one is the dawn phenomena in dawn phenomena it's not the increase in basal what happens uh, the body clock is such that in the early mo morning hours the growth hormones is released in the body so this growth hormone causes hyperglycemia or again there would be increased blood glucose in morning this is known as dawn phenomena so in dawn phenomena and somogia phenomena in both these conditions the morning blood sugar is high what is the difference the difference is that in between there is a period of hypoglycemia which only occurs in somogia phenomena but not in dawn phenomena so the treatment would be that in case of somogia phenomena what you need to do you need to increase you need to increase sorry you need to decrease the level of the basal insulin uh, dosage because if you further increase it by mistake what would happen there would be more severe hypoglycemia and that hypoglycemia can even kill the child that can be a deadly mistake so if it is a somogia phenomenon the treatment would always be remember always be decrease the nighttime insulin decrease 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 this you should always remember in case of dawn phenomena because it's growth hormone a growth hormone is causing hyperglycemia you need to increase in dawn phenomena you would need to increase while in somogi phenomena you need to decrease the nighttime insulin now, this is very important and as i told you that the common complications are diabetic ketoacidosis that is altogether a different domain i think i have discussed it uh, the latest uh, dka guidelines uh, i think in uk the british society of pediatric endocrinology has uh, updated the um, pediatric dka guidelines my lecture is already there i will put that link in the description box below so if you want to have um, more knowledge about the dka then you can watch uh, that lecture anyhow at the same time it's also very important that the child is constantly monitored for long-term complications so they should be having like you know uh, blood pressure regular blood pressure examination regular eye examination to rule obviously background maculopathy or retinopathy cataracts thing like that 
thyroid monitoring is also very important because sometimes in uh, those who have got like autoimmune phenomena associated with that so they can have uh different types of other autoimmune uh, conditions uh, associated with that so they might have like autoimmune thyroid disease they might even have celiac disease so celiac scanning uh, scanning uh, scanning for thyroid uh, this is part of the long term uh, management of uh, diabetes renal monitoring also very important to look for any like you know uh, proteinuria and other things microangiopathy in the renal vessels and obviously looking for lipodystrophy because sometimes the child is getting injection and things so that might lead to lipodystrophy in one part so it's very important to rotate the sites so uh, this is in a nutshell like the comprehensive management of diabetes so it's not only the insulin it's at the same time you know meal planning looking for the complications checking regularly the blood glucose levels having a team you know effort between gp between a pediatric consultant between diabetic nurse between dietitian to make a comprehensive plan and also giving the mental health cover for these kids as well uh, remember the uh, uh, no uh, uh, a little bit about the other form of diabetes i told you earlier as well the child who present with the diabetes in the first year of life genetic testing should be taken it's very important because i told you that those who present in the first year of life most of them they have got monogenic diabetes so monogenic diabetes is genetic in nature so you need to find out those genes that are responsible and um, uh, the thing is that uh, because if I've seen like many babies have unnecessarily been started on insulin like three months or four months of age with neonatal diabetes in fact they can only be treated with like you know half a tablet of sulfonylureas or something so that's why it's important to find out those who have got monogenic diabetes and then treat them accordingly so because most of them they're not treated with insulin so uh, at least it's important to pick up those who have got monogenic diabetes if a child who rarely develops ketonemia is obese or as i told you has got a strong family history of type 2 diabetes is of african asian origin or has got symptoms like acanthosis nigricans which is like hyperpigmentation of the neck uh, skin or the axillary skin then you should be suspecting uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus and then you can do the c-peptide levels and get 65 antibodies in those things just to you know differentiate it from type 1 and also never forget the uh, secondary causes of diabetes especially if the child has got associated features of uh, other organ involvement or they've got like um, um uh, they're they're known to have like a, like some associated medical condition like adrenal gland pathology or renal pathology or some other like endocrine problems so it's important that in that particular case you should be considering secondary cause of diabetes as well and i told you some of the conditions like cystic fibrosis hemochromatosis cushing syndrome these they, they can cause secondary diabetes as well so it's important to take into consideration those things as well and certain drugs might cause diabetes so again it's like steroid those who are on prolonged steroid therapy might develop uh, secondary diabetes so that is also important thing to take into consideration because you need to treat the root cause if you want to treat the diabetes and secondary diabetes is usually treatable because if you just cure the root causes then obviously the hyperglycemia would be corrected but type 1 diabetes is a lifelong condition so they have to live with that so that's important that you know all these things which are presenting in the same way you need to differentiate who is actually type 1 diabetic and who is like a secondary diabetes or who has got monogenic diabetes because their treatments they differ and i've already told you some of the things by which you can differentiate these uh, conditions moving on to um, uh, let's say discuss some uh, cases uh, this is a 16 year old girl who presents to the a &E and she has recently arrived in uk from india where she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and uh, her mother gives that the history of the girl's blood sugar has always been difficult to control so she has was diagnosed as diabetic back in india and her blood glucose levels control has always been a problem she has been suffering from polydipsy and polyuria for several weeks now she's not to be thin she's quite thin and she weighs only 20 kg and her insulin regime is mixed start she is on mixed start 30 she gets 15 units in the morning and 10 units before the evening meal she rotates injection site and it's got no evidence of lipodystrophy uh, blood sugar 
beside testing shows a uh, blood glucose level of 32 millimoles and the venous gas is done which is shown as a ph is 7.42 pco2 is 4 po2 uh, is 3.8 bicarb is 19 sodium 138 potassium 4.5 chloride 106 and base access 0.5 uh, HbA1c is 14.9, she is euthyroid, nothing wrong with the thyroid, and celiac screen is negative. So this girl is admitted to the ward to, to get a better understanding of why the blood glu glucose control is so poor and what's going on. So her blood sugars are measured six times uh, in the ward. And uh, it seems that uh, it, the glycemic control is, is, is varying a lot. So most of her blood glucose levels are in the 20 millimoles range, but she has two episodes of hypoglycemia as well at the same time, one in the afternoon and one in the evening. So her insulin is increased to 16 units in the morning instead of 15 and instead of 10, it's increased to 11 units at the night time. And at the same time, because it's still not controlling her blood sugar, she undergoes a short synecton test at 8 a.m. Uh, one morning and the results are to follow so the cortisol at zero minutes was 582 millimoles and nanomoles and then it increased to 963 and then 1000 uh, at uh, one hour so what is the most likely cause of these results so i will give you some time you think on it and then try to answer this so just to summarize this this is um 10 year old girl i think probably i said 60 no this is a 10 year old girl which is quite thin for her age has got type 1 diabetes which is very poorly controlled despite having insulin in the morning and at night time she's not skipping on any insulin it's been increased but still the uh, control the glycemic control is quite poor and if you see the hba1c is 14.9 which is which is quite bad so probably in the last two three months she's been having like a very poor uh, glycemic uh, control now obviously with that, you are always worried about, like with a with a with a blood sugar levels of uh, 32, you'd be worried that she has got diabetic ketoacidosis. So that's why cap gas is done. So ketone levels, let's say, are point, not 0 0.2 when they are normal. pH, if you look here, yeah. pH is 7.42, so she is not acidotic. Uh, carbon dioxide is four, well, on the lower limit of the normal. Uh, that's fine. PCO2, obviously, this is a venous gas, so nothing exciting here bicarbonate slightly on the lower side sodium is normal potassium and chloride seem fine and base x is also fine so with this normal ph even i don't think there is any high you know in gap so she is certainly not uh, uh, in, in ketoacidosis so what do you think she has got if you look at the cortisol levels so 582 at zero levels then 963 at half hour then one thousand so it seems like cortisol basal levels were fine in eight and then so after you know it was short sinus uh, dexamethasone was given so you see there's been increase in the cortisol levels so this actually rules up because you see that's been gradually increasing period of time so that rules out secondary diabetes so there's nothing going on like another cause like an in, like increase in cortisol or something so secondary diabetes is ruled out another thing if you look here she just weighs 20 kg and she's having 15 units in the morning and 10 units in the evening so that comes out to be 25 units now for the 20 kg well she should be having maximum of 20 units so she is on very high insulin and if you look to uh, uh it was increased to 11 units that's quite a high insulin both in the morning and in the evening so probably this one is contributing to increase blood sugars in the morning or in the afternoon and that one is uh, you know responsible for increasing the uh, blood sugar level number but then leading to hypoglycemia as well so this is probably a somogi phenomena in the morning followed by hypoglycemic attacks as well so remember it cannot be like you know we talk about smoggy phenomena that it would be morning hyperglycemia but again that is a textbook description 
usually what happens that if they have got like increase even in the morning and even at this girl is not on a basal bolus she's on like a on a premix regime and i told you that premix regime is usually not recommended because that leads to poor glycemic control you will be just increasing the dose of insulin and it would not be increasing the glycemic control so child would be having very erratic uh, blood glucose levels that would be high and then would be having hypos as well so like would be swinging between two extremes so this has got a somogi phenomena and basically the reason is that oh, somogi we say okay well fine it's usually the increase in basal insulin at night but in this case because she's on the premix regime she's getting actually a lot more insulin than what she needs so the most likely cause of this results is that she has got no secondary diabetes and basically she is having more insulin than what is needed so this child insulin was brought down or started on basal bolus insulin and she became better everything became better she had a good glycemic control so this just under uh, you know um, uh, underlines the importance of proper uh, usage of basal bolus basal bolus insulin and um, at the same time ensuring that the insulin is given according to what is the recommended regime not going beyond that because then it can lead to complications like erratic blood glucose control let's go through another uh, case and that is a 16 year old type 1 diabetic which presents with the complaint of weakness she's got sleepiness and vivid dreams for the last two months and which has not gone away despite being prescribed some multivitamins by the gp so she went to the gp and it's thought that she might be having some like form of vitamin deficiency because of that she's feeling weak and sleepy and like having very vivid dreams so prescribed some multivitamins which haven't worked she denies any other symptom and has got a past history of this type 1 diabetes for the last six years and is on basal bolus insulin for the last six months so she was she's been diabetic for six years but the basal bolus insulin basal bolus insulin is been there on her prescription for the last six months only before that she was on the mixed insulin twice daily regimen again the premix regime uh, so her blood glucose levels have been erratic despite being on good diet and her blood uh, glucose levels which she checks twice daily are less than 10 millimoles per she's on oral contraceptive pill and she drinks on weekends on examination all system examinations are normal bmi is 23 which is normal pulse 80 beats per minute and blood pressure is also normal basic investigation show hemoglobin which seems fine white blood cells seems fine sodium is fine potassium is fine glucose is 7.9 millimoles random one and hbac 6.2 so pretty much everything is normal here so what do you think is the cause of this weakness sleepiness and vivid dreams for the last two months she hasn't got anything on examination everything is fine even the blood glucose levels are fine they are less than 10 millimoles and here when you randomly checked it 7.9 millimoles and there's a good hba one c which is 6.2 and the rest of the parameters are also normal think here for a moment for a moment and so this girl has basically got nighttime hypoglycemic attacks nighttime hypoglycemic attacks why because she has got weakness sleepiness and vivid dreams remember the other thing could be like could it be like some form of complex seizures again hypoglycemia can cause seizures but this doesn't seem to be seizures these vivid dreams are remember most strongly associated with the hypoglycemia so probably she is on a high basal insulin at night time which causes a hypoglycemia and obviously she doesn't get like hyper uh, glycemia uh, in the morning it's usually less than 10 millimoles but it's leading to hypoglycemia in the night time the early hours of the morning so she need to decrease the nighttime insulin so the night time insulin insulin should be reduced in order to you know take 
uh, in order to like you know uh, treat these symptoms vivid dreams weakness and sleepiness this is because of what hypoglycemia So in these two examples, I just try to emphasize the importance of a comprehensive uh, management of diabetes. Remember, diagnosing diabetes is easy. Anybody can diagnose it. Managing it is more difficult. Why? Because it's not simply like prescribing them with the insulin and then say, okay, well, go ahead and use this for the rest of your life. It's about constant monitoring of the blood glucose levels it's about adjusting the insulin levels it's about looking for the complications it's about patient education it's about diet it's about mental health it's about everything else it's about simply comprehensive management remember the word comprehensive multidisciplinary management so this was all about diabetes with special focus on type 1 diabetes in pediatric practice hope you have learned something new and if you have learned something new then please share it with your friends have a very good day i'm signing off bye bye